Homeworld Desert of Karak is a game where you build a huge fleet of vehicles to fight your way across a mostly desert planet. The reason you fight across the desert is to get a hold of an ancient artifact that will help your people escape the dying world of Karak. Also to set up the events in the first two Homeworld games made by Relic Entertainment and then remastered by Gearbox Software. This game however wasn't always going to be a prequel to the Homeworld games, originally it was going to be a spiritual successor to them, called Hardware Shipbreakers. A game in which you'd scavenge wrecked ships which are conveniently on a desert planet very similar to where the first Homeworld games started on. They were very subtle about it being a spiritual successor as you can tell by the font they used. The team making the game, Blackbird Interactive, had some of the original people from Relic who made those Homeworld games back in the day help work on this one. So it was going to be a pretty legit spiritual successor until an opportunity came up where THQ went bankrupt and the Homeworld IP went up for sale. Blackbird now had a chance to get the IP and make a full on legit Homeworld game, but then the auction happened and they got outbid by Gearbox Software. Being humble and defeat, Blackbird Interactive approached Gearbox and asked, so what are you going to do with the IP? To which Gearbox said, um, nothing, we just wanted to keep it safe from bad developers and stuff. This is when Blackbird told them about their game called Hardware Shipbreakers, which could easily be turned into a Homeworld game. See, it even has the same font and everything. Gearbox, after giving it some deep thought, well, more than they did in buying the IP, decided, okay, Blackbird, go for it. And Hardware Shipbreakers became Homeworld Deserts of Crack. Though the game did keep some ideas from the original concepts and inspired a similarly named game, but this time an FPS called Hard Space Shipbreakers. But that's a whole nother story. Now having access to the Homeworld IP, Blackbird could reshape the original hardware story Story to fit into the homeworld one and make it into a prequel. It's set about a hundred plus years in the past showing events that were in the very first cutscenes of the first homeworld game, where you see an artifact detected deep in the desert and being discovered, but instead of the narrator vaguely telling you about what happens, you now get to play out that story. But before I get into that, let's talk about how the game runs. The game runs mostly okay with only a few hiccups here and there, though when looking at the settings I was a little underwhelmed as they were not as in depth as the remastered homeworld games, where you could scale the UI to your liking, but it does mostly what you need and at least they make the visuals as good as the remastered games. The details on the units again are pretty good, with effects like dust clouds following the tracks of vehicles as they travel across the sand. You can tell the team put a lot of effort in, even with them going so far as to model the vehicle movement to be as accurate as they could, which gives the units weight to their movement, making them seem like massive vehicles, with only some slight bugs here and there. The art style for cutscenes has changed a little bit, but it's still great. They are mixing the older motion graphics from previous games with more dynamic shots by combining live action and 3D modeling. It feels new but still gives the feeling of a home or game, which is pretty cool. The only visual complaint I have is I wish I could zoom out just a little bit more before needing to switch to the tactical view. Which to be fair is still good, they even keep that cool zooming in and out sound effect that I like. But the view of the actual battlefield feels a little constrained compared to previous Homeworld games, though what is there is fun to watch. While you're enjoying the visuals, you'll also notice the chatter between units, which is a nice touch that gives the units and crew character while doing everyday tasks in these vehicles. And it gets amped up when actual combat happens. Put fire on their armor. The sound effects are also fairly solid, though maybe not quite as good as the remastered collection. The railgun and missile effects sound great, but the explosions aren't quite as impactful. Take it out. Though the music is still as excellent as previous games, using a mix of Indian instruments and vocals with western string instruments, with a little synth thrown in, perfect for vibing in the desert. It's not just the music that's similar to previous games, the story and missions do this too, with a story that mirrors the one in the original Homeworld games, but also mixes in some new story beats, while also throwing in some similar sounding names you might have heard in the previous games. Like you'll hear the name Sajet a lot, which is a reference to Corrin Sajet who gets put into the mothership as a living core in both outer space Homeworld games. They do this plenty of times, almost to the point of feels like most of the crew is directly related, but if you dive into the lore bit, you'll find out the last names are more like extended clan names called Kith, with some of these clans having hundreds of thousands of members, but not being directly related. It's a little complicated. Best way I could describe it is imagine if your last name was your country instead of your family name, like Bob USA instead of Bob Ross. To help players understand some of this lore, Blackbird made an app thing called the Expedition Guide, which they charged money for. It probably should have been a free add-on though, as charging people money to understand the lore in your game is Maybe not the smartest move ever, but it's not essential to enjoying the game and most of the information can be found for free if you google it. Also the game itself does a fairly good job of laying out the basics of its lore and characters with cutscenes and personal logs that play at the end of missions. They help get a sense of how the crew is doing and what they're thinking. It reminds me a lot of mission logs from Star Trek. These personal logs help you get more invested in the story of the characters in these massive units and what they're fighting for and going up against, which is an enemy with a strong religious belief that no one on the planet should go into space or it'll be the end of the world. And I mean they were 
kind of right if you played the previous Homeworld games, this enemy called the Galcian have more advanced technology than you. They're kind of like religious Mad Max marauders who found MacBook Pros in the desert or something. Well, your carrier and vehicles have to travel on slowish tracks. The Galcian having found long buried tech in the desert gives them access to advanced weapons with fancy floating carriers and vehicles that make them a little faster than you. But they are not as armored as your units, so at least you have that going for you. Like the previous games, you need to think tactically, but in deserts are correct, they added a bit of spice to the gameplay. You won't only need to worry about positioning your units, but ground elevation too. As we all know, if you have the high ground, you have the advantage. And not paying attention to that can have bad consequences, as not only do you get a range benefit, but a damage one too. Also, terrain can block your shots, which will force you to reposition to get a better angle on enemies. In spite of this, the combat is fairly similar to the previous Homeworld games. Though there aren't formations, and the maps feel smaller, which kind of makes sense since you're not navigating an open 3D space anymore. But I would like the maps to be a bit bigger, as sometimes they feel a bit confining. Though the units do have useful abilities like the light attack units have a speed boost and the tanks have a smoke screen, which can help a fair bit with delaying enemy fire and helping other units escape bad situations. The best changes I feel are for this game's version of the mothership, which is the command carrier of the Capici, which serves a more active role in this game than being just a mobile production base, because now it can launch strike fighters and bombers which are more powerful than in previous games, with the trade-off being that they need to return to the carrier to rearm and refuel. In addition, the Capici can now be taken directly into battle to help with repairs or attack, but to do this effectively you need to balance power distribution for the different systems on the carrier, such as repair, turrets and armor. And eventually the Capici gets a cruise missile ability to use, which is pretty fun. At the start of the game, the usefulness of the Capici might be a bit limited because it can't generate a lot of power and it might overheat if you push the systems too hard. But just like the Galsian, you can use tech you find in the desert to upgrade these systems. This comes in the form of artifacts, which as you progress through the story you'll find more via one of the game's mechanics left over from when the game was going to be called Hardware Shipbreakers. Bet you can't guess what the game mechanic is. Yeah, it's shipbreaking. Okay, so it's like breaking apart an easter egg with a nice gooey center to get to the good bits inside, which usually has a lot of resources and sometimes a bonus artifact. You'll break these ships apart by using one of Rachel Suggett's special abilities to lob small explosive charges near a wreck to break it up. Though this isn't the only thing Rachel's vehicle can do during the game, as she gets more abilities during the campaign, almost like a hero unit from Warcraft 3. Like scanning areas, repairing units, or using EMP weapons to disable enemies for a bit, and even the ability to hack enemy vehicles so you can add them to your forces. She is however the only unit that allows you to capture enemy units, which combined with the ability cooldown very much limits how many units you can capture in this game. Which is disappointing to me, as I really like capturing enemy units and adding them to my forces in the previous Homeworld games. Also while the game has removed unit caps for specific vehicles like the previous games, the overall cap of your units is reduced at the start, but gradually gets bigger as you progress through the story getting newer units. I kinda understand why this was done as it prevents players from reaching the maximum unit cap of 200 before being able to build newer more powerful units. And maybe the limits of the game engine couldn't allow for more units to be shown on screen. Though I do wish I could build more units in the game, and even me using all the extra resources for upgrading units, I still had a large pile of resources left over, and nothing to spend it on in the later parts of the game. But at least the pace of progression with getting new units and abilities while playing the game kept missions interesting and engaging. And there wasn't any difficulty spikes this time around as each mission was pretty straightforward, but if you want to make it harder you can always put the difficulty to classic. Yeah, the hard difficulty is called classic in this game, so they knew. Another thing about the game that was interesting was the story, but before I jump into that, if you don't want spoilers then skip to here. The story starts with a bit of a dramatic scene, setting the stakes for the planet of Karak. The planet is slowly dying because the desert is getting bigger, the world is at war and they're running out of resources, so only slightly worse off than Earth. But there might be a chance to save the people on Karak, as an object of great significance has been detected deep in the desert by a satellite that might help save them. It's not exactly said why you need to find this thing, but it's hinted that it's probably super advanced tech or something. So Rachel Suggett helps with setting up an expedition to go and get this object, but it isn't going to be easy, as not only will the expedition have to fight the desert sand, but some desert crazies who are jacked up on some pretty powerful tech they've found in the desert. The first mission hits the same beats as other homeworld games where things are getting tested for launch and the carrier still needs to be kitted out. But there is some added urgency as you need to get some last minute maintenance done while under fire. Remember, there is a war on while this expedition is being launched directly into enemy territory. So with that minor maintenance problem out the way, the expedition goes full steam ahead. While setting out, we get a log entry between missions from Rachel Sajet who mentions her brother being right about whatever is out in the desert being key to their survival, hinting that this isn't the first mission 
to be launched for this thing. The Capisi is supposed to meet up with another carrier called the Sokolo, which is controlled by coalition allies before going deeper into the desert. But before that, the Capisi finds the wreck of a previous expedition that was sent out years before and went missing. Turns out Rachel Shazette's brother was on that ship and found a useful artifact the Capisi could use to upgrade its systems. Though there's no sign of her brother. He did leave some log entries that show the location of a crash ship with a lot of resources and maybe more artifacts the expedition could use. Total Big Brother move. He's like this game's version of the Ben Tuzi from the other Homeworld games. So the Capisi heads straight to the crash ship and starts breaking it down for resources. However, the enemy catches up to the Capisi and they brought a lot of big guns to take him out for sure this time. Just as things start to look dire, some friends show up. Yeah, you forgot about the Sakala, didn't you? With reinforcements from the Sakala, who has a grumpy I told you so captain, you push back the enemy forces, but they manage to escape. To stop further pursuit for at least a little while, the Capisi and Sakala captains come up with a plan to take out the enemy. By getting the main enemy carrier to chase the Sakala while the Capisi attacks its resource gathering operations. This plan mostly works until the enemy carrier comes charging back to take the Capisi on by itself. But if you've prepared for this outcome, you'll have an easy time taking it out. Even when the enemy carrier uses a kind of secret weapon being an EMP attack that knocks out your forces, but only for a few seconds, which is really like, is that all you got? Maybe the harder missions from previous Homeworld games prepared me too well or something. With that sort of the expedition continues deeper into the desert and comes across an enemy fortress which might have some goodies inside, so they decide to take it on. Using the same tactic as before, with the Sokola drawing off the defenders while the Capisi attacks what's left, eventually getting access to the fortress, with Rachel heading inside to find out more about the enemy's tech and their motives. Being that the site you're heading towards might actually be a buried ancient city that if found, they believe will allow their leader who likes chilling in hammocks while giving speeches to become ruler of the world. After getting what they need from the base and beating some of the lost defenders, Rachel escapes from the fortress while it's blowing up. Going further into the desert, the expedition comes across really well preserved ships that were somehow hyperspace directly into the rock, which is a nice little reference to how ships travel faster than light in other Homeworld games. Apparently, the object they are heading towards is also somehow stopping spaceships from traveling close to Carrick, by either causing them to crash, which is why there's so much tech just lying around in the desert, or forcing them to park underground. So whatever this tech is by the object, it's obviously really powerful and probably shouldn't end up in the hands of the enemy, who are still trying to prevent the expedition from going deeper into the desert. Though the enemy's leader, the Hammock guy, has figured out where exactly the expedition is going and is trying to beat them to it. And he has a big lead. Also, your expedition is running low on supplies and needs to capture a plateau in order for these huge resupply planes to land. So, sucks to be you. But you've got a little luck on your side as an unknown weapon satellite is firing on the enemy approaching the object, preventing them from getting close. With the Capisi still waiting for supplies to arrive, Rachel Sajek goes out to investigate the signal that triggered the weapon satellite. All looks like it's going to plan until the grumpy Sokola captain, who's been a fairly good ally until this point, says thanks for helping us get this far and you're really swell people and all, but my clan really wants that object for themselves. So I'm going to betray you now and shoot down your resupply plane too. Bye! But at least one of the Capisi's supply planes managed to land, so at least you have a chance to continue the expedition and get some revenge on a former grumpy ally. Meanwhile, Rachel found the source of the signal, and it turns out to be a crashed Tidan carrier, like the one from the first Homeworld game, which before it crashed deployed a powerful weapon satellite. Also, we find out her brother had been captured by the enemy. He found out about the Tidan carrier and the satellite while being imprisoned. So in another Total Big Brother move, he decides to escape and reprogram it to protect the object, which basically gives you an iron cannon from Tiberian Sun to use in the last mission. Pretty cool, big bro, though he had to die to make that happen though. So now with all that convenient plot development out the way, the grumpy Sokola captain is on the way to get Rachel so he can gain access to this weapon satellite. After being attacked by some of the Sokola's forces, Rachel manages to hold out and escape with the weapon satellite trigger until the Capisi, which has been running on overdrive to get to her, manages to arrive. It brought some of the expedition's forces as fast as it could, and more arrives as the mission progresses, so you can get some revenge on the Sokala for that friendly fire incident. With that sorted and control of the weapon satellite, the Capisi makes one last push to finally get the object before the enemy. This is where you have one last battle against the Gaussian, and they brought their biggest and best stuff to take you out. Including a new supercarrier, with the enemy leader still chilling on a hammock inside it. He really likes that hammock. You might be outnumbered a little, but you have the high ground and a fully armed and operational iron cannon to take on the Gaussian. Eventually you destroy the supercarrier with the enemy leader on it, who goes down with his hammock while warning you that you're going to bring destruction to Carrick. I'm sure he's over exaggerating. With that, the story ends with Rachel thinking about her brother and the future to come, which is Homeworld 1. Deserts of Carrack continues the great storytelling and gameplay of the first Homeworld games with just a little bit of a different perspective, and adds some new gameplay mechanics that I enjoyed a fair bit. It has very few flaws for me to point to, like maybe the lack of formations and UI options and a better ability to zoom out, but that would be me nitpicking. Some players might find the difficulty a fair bit more chilled than previous Homeworld games, but at least there aren't any difficulties spikes in this game that I found, which I think is an improvement. So overall, I can definitely 
recommend trying out this game. It's making me look forward to what Blackbird does with Homeworld 3, as if they continue with the improvements and don't mess it up somehow, they could make Homeworld 3 be something special. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, consider subscribing. See you next time.